instructs in the spirit of prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to share ideas and learn. We pray for guidance in this endeavor. Quicken our understanding. Anoint our eyes and ears so that they are open to your wisdom. Give us fortitude to complete the work that must be done. For your greater glory. Again, good morning and welcome to the Senate PIDS Economic Forum Series. So for those who are not yet familiar, this knowledge sharing activity has actually been going on for several years already. I think since 2001. And the purpose really is to share, to disseminate to us technical staff and officers of the Senate the research findings or outputs of our government impact in the PIDS in the hope that our principals, the senators, to we'll use them and maybe take them into take them into consideration as they go about their task of policy making. So for today we have a very timely topic: the proposed tax reform program of the Duterte administration. So timely that actually there's another committee hearing that's about to happen. I think 10:30, um, right next door on this same topic. So guess we're gonna make a bit here. But uh, anyway, before we start our pro forum proper, uh, let me call on uh, Dep our Deputy Secretary for your Legislation, Attorney Edwin Daniel, to give his welcoming remarks in behalf of the Senate Secretary. Build, build, 
wrong on the tax reform program. And that is, without taxes, there can be nothing to help us build. We need to build something where of the train could run. We are highly favored with the presence of Dr. Manas and Dr. Yanko. And I know that with their expertise, all of us will be benefited from this discussion. And the Senate and our fellow Filipinos will surely be the gainers from this exercise. Thank you very much. Good morning and welcome to the afternoon. To your stand. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, please welcome Sebo and Executive Director Marvin Salazar to introduce our guest speaker. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our guest uh, speaker for today, though I believe that uh, you are already familiar with her, uh, as she is a permanent figure in the Senate hearings, uh, particularly that of the Committee on Finance, Ways and Means, and Economic Affairs, as well as in the seminars uh, hosted by the CEPO, such as the Senate Centennial Lecture Series. And that is not surprising because um, she is the fiscal expert of the Philippines. She has uh, uh, extensively written on public finance, fiscal decentralization, and on, and on education. I have read and used her uh, research works uh, back during my time in UFD, and although I've met her after graduating from my master's and joined the World Bank project on public expenditure review and on decentralization, and up to now I still uh, use her um, uh, research uh, studies and it gives me, uh, it elicits my mind and uh, educate me on matters pertaining to fiscal issues in the country. And I just admire her analytical and writing prowess. I, and I think this is my uh, opinion that she could be the best candidate for the position of Secretary of Finance. <laughs> and I hope she, she, she would be given that opportunity to serve in that position before she retires, despite, uh, and I am presuming, of her being an apolitical. So without further ado, let, let me call in Dr. Chad Manasan of PIDS. Now, 
these are some of the issues that pertain to specific types of taxes. For the personal income tax, as workers in government, we all know and experience the seemingly inequity of the personal income tax. There's the bracket creep, which makes even low, you know, middle level government workers pay, say, at 30% top margin or 30% marginal tax rates. The corporate income tax is one of the highest in ASEAN and is really working against Philippine, uh, against the competitiveness of Philippine industries, fiscal incentives. There is the problem of redundant incentives, the VAT too many exemptions, excise tax on petroleum. The problem is the erosion of peso denominated rate due to inflation and then efficiency issues. Why is diesel, which is more pollutive, uh, tax at zero or at a lower rate than gasoline? And then taxation of financial instruments lack of neutrality in the sense that the tax on savings or deposits is different from the tax on other types of financial assets. The overall objective of the 230 tax reform program is to redesign the tax system to make it simpler, fairer, more efficient, and to raise revenue. So it's a twin, twin objective and raise more revenue to fund government social economic agenda. So for build, 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 na mention na What is significant or maybe notable about the Duterte tax reform uh, program is that it consists of a number of packages. So far I've heard of five packages and we're at package one. And this is significant because for the first time, I think in the history of the Philippines, um, the legislature is looking at a package of tax measures instead of piecemeal uh, tax, uh, tax measures. Prior to this, there were attempts to pass uh, the tax reform uh, there is the so-called comprehensive tax reform program of 1997. Pero yun, sa pangalan lang comprehensive. In the end, I think isa o dalawang component lang yung nakapasa. And ang nakapasa pa yung revenue losing. Another point that is significant about the tax reform program is the earmarking of part of the revenue gain for targeted transfers. These are the components of package one. Reform of personal income tax, but, but reform increase in excise tax on petroleum, excise tax on automobiles, reduction in the estate and donors taxes, and the introduction of an excise tax on sugary drinks. Take note that the last one is in HB 5636, which is the version of the train that was approved by the House Committee on Ways and Means, but not in the original submission of uh, Congressman Kuwa, nor in SB 1408. Now, let me walk you through some of the provisions uh, of the various reform or various versions of the trade. First, on personal income. What is significant here is that all three versions have practically the same provisions with regards to personal <coughs> income tax. It will adapt a differential system, meaning magkaiba ng paraan. Oh, so it will adopt a different personal income tax regime for one, the compensation income earners like you and me, and the self-employed and professionals. For the, for, for the compensation income earners, the tax base is the modified gross income, 
No deductions or allowances. Kung ano yung sweldo mo yun na yun, except for the bonus, basically. And then the tax rate is a graduated rate schedule where 0% is levied on incomes not over 250,000. So effectively, pag 20,000 pesos per month ang sweldo ng isang tao, wala na siyang tax. So yung entry level debt ed teacher will be subject to zero tax. The top marginal rate has been increased from 35 from 32 to 35 but applicable to incomes above 5 million instead of the present 500,000. Take note that when you look at the 2015 family income expenditure surveys only 35% of households have annual income greater than 250,000 per year. So that means only thir yung 65 wala nang babayaran under the proposed measure. Now let me talk about the provisions of these bills on self-employed and professional self-employed individuals and professionals. First, the bills divide the sex into two groups. Those with gross receipts below 3 million and those with gross receipts above 3 million. Those with gross receipts not over 3 million will be taxed based on their, I'm sorry, based on their gross sales a flat rate of 8%. Those with gross sales receipts above 3 million will be taxed differently. In the case of HB 4774 and 5636, they will be subject to a flat rate of 30%, which is equal to the corporate income tax rate. The tax base is, of course, net income, and the optional standard redu deduction is reduced from 40 to 20. Under SB 1408, there is no provision on the tax rate for uh, sets within gross receipts above 3 million. So we had, I consulted Norman in fact yesterday. And what did it say on the provision? Uh, in the analysis that you will see here, I assume that it is the same as HB 4774. Because pag walang provision, I was thinking, ano bang ibig sabihin? Hindi na sila itatax, hindi naman siguro. Uh, itatax sila at the schedule of the compensation income. But the bill says that the schedule is for compensation income earners only. So, I assume they will be taxed at, in the same manner as HB 4774 and Okay, what is the implication of all this? Individuals with compensation income be below 5 million will pay significantly lower PIP than compared to the present. The opposite is true for individuals with compensation income above 5 million. Kasi nga, tinaasan yung top marginal rate. Uh, ito na sabi ko na. Magiging zero na yung tax ng entry level debt at teacher compared to 22,500 kung meron siyang dalawang anak and 35,000 kung single siya. So this represents indeed significant savings for many workers employed. Now in terms of uh, self-employed individuals and professionals with gross sales higher than 3 million from 2020 onwards, these individuals will be taxed more heavily than the corporate, uh, than the compensation earners with compar comparable income levels while the opposite is true for steps with net income above nine, about nine million. Now, 
let's talk about the self-employed individuals and professionals with gross receipts below three million. <laughs> Take note that when you look at this group, in fact, all sets, they are very heterogeneous. Kasama dyan yung small store owners, food service providers, sari-sari store, nagtitinda sa palengke, etc. Kasama din dyan yung mga doctors, lawyers, and other professionals, yung mga consultants. Now, the effective tax rate or the ratio of tax liability relative to net income for this group of individuals would vary depending on their profit margin. Meaning, ano ba talaga yung net income relative to gross sales? And when we look at some data, we noted na yung mga professionals have high profit margin because practically what they're selling is their labor, di ba? Wala naman silang masyadong sinusweltuhan. Yung doktor, siguro meron lang siyang sekretarya dun sa labas, etc. Pero yung mga nasa retail, sari-sari store, etc., ang mga profit margins noon would maybe range between 30%, Maba, medyo mababa na yun, or 30-40%, di ba? So, and what happens here is that sex with lower profit margins will have higher effective tax rates than sex with higher profit margins. So parang uh, this proposal, in a sense, works against sex na mababa yung profit margins, like the small store owners. Yes, please. Can I make a comment? I'm Grace from Office of Senator Pimentel. Um, I just, you're correct, ma'am, no? So there's no provision for on SEPs above the threshold. But as early as now, I would like to um, manifest that our intent was really to, to for those above 3 million, part to revert them to the scheduler rate. Okay. So we might want to, I mean, so far as this analysis is concerned, SB 1408 is not grouped with House Bill. Thank okay. you, ma'am. We'll, we'll take note of that, in fact. I got that message from Marvin yesterday and ah. we gave some lands. Thank you. Okay, so this provides more favorable treatment dun sa mga self-employed, uh, dun sa mga professionals compared to the small uh, store, store owners, for instance. So here what we see is that on the average, uh, reduced uh, PIT liability of compensation earners in all deciles and higher uh, tax liability, I'm sorry. So lahat siya negative, bababa lahat for all deciles, pag compensation income, pero pag set income, tataas. On the whole, tataas yung tax liability pag combine na silang dalawa dito sa lower deciles compared to the higher deciles. So, pag ito lang ang titignan natin, yung conclusion is hindi siya pro-poor. Pag ito lang ang na natin. Ang tax take, by the way, I'm sorry, ang tax take is a reduction equal to about 0.8% of GDP in the revenue take of government in years 1 and 2 and a reduction of 0.9% of GDP in year 3 onwards. Then I would like to point out that pag kinumpare natin at least for HB 4774 and HB 5636. Pag natin yung effective tax rate on set income, compared to the existing regime, ang laki ng increase. So what does that imply? That in, 
raises the risk that tax compliant com or collection efficiency may decline. Kasi nga, instead na they'd be encouraged to pay more, kasi usually the, 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 the narrative is that if you want to encourage your taxpayers to pay more, impose a lower rate. Diba? But now, we're imposing a higher rate, so the tendency, or there's greater temptation for them to evade taxes. At the same time, it in, these provisions introduce what we call horizontal inefficiency, inequity, I'm sorry. Horizontal inequity, meaning magkaiba yung treatment one ng compensation earners accepts with SEP having EPRs 3.7 times that of the compensation income earners. <coughs> also, there's such a big jump in the tax of sex dun sa margin ng 3 million gross receipts. Because especially for the professionals. Kasi pag professional ka, very low profit margin, or rather, balik that, very high profit margin, if you are there at the border of 3 million, ang tax mo less than 10%. Tapos biglang pag mag-exceed ka kahit piso, beyond 3 million gross receipts, tataas bigla yung tax mo to 30% of your gross income. So maybe 27%. So ano ang tendency? More pronounced work leisure trade-off. Iisipin mo talaga, gusto ko pa bang magtrabaho to earn para kukonti pa yung take home take ko or wag na lang relax relax chill muna tayo and then greater incentive for SEPs to under declare gross receipts kung kaya nilang mag under declare winners and losers from personal income tax reform medyo nasabi ko na the biggest winners are the CIEs belonging to the richest decile Kasi although pinaaksan yung top marginal tax rate from 32 to 35, konting-konting tao lang naman yun eh, na may ganung income. Uh, I was reading a market survey na ang sabi nila, 1% lang daw ng households ang merong income above 2 million annual. So, ilang percent kaya yung may income above 5 million na tataas yung tax? So, maybe less than half a percent, maybe half a percent at best. So, hindi talaga makikita dito na mag increase yung income nila. The biggest losers are the sets from the poorest decile. Ang laki ng increase sa tax now, VAT. Ito, undeniably, uh, pare-pareho yung provisions, basically. Remove VAT exemptions of agricultural cooperatives, uh, gross receipts from lending of credit and multi-purpose co-ops, sales of non-agri, non-credit, non-electric, socialized low-cost housing, lease of residential property with money to income below 10 million power transmission and change the treatment the VAT treatment of indirect exports from zero rated to VATable except when sold to PESA locators uh, ito yung discussion last time doon sa committee for those of you who attended the committee and then increase the VAT threshold from 1.5 million to 3 million. Meaning, pag ang gross receipts mo below 3 million, hindi ka subject to VAT. Unless you opt to be subject to VAT. In which case, you pay a flat uh, percentage tax of 3% based on gross. 
On renewable energy, medyo magkaiba sila ng provision. Sa HB4774 and SB1408, change from zero rated to VAT exempt. Under 566 from stay at zero rated as it is at present. Um, I have a link here which says link to a digression which is found at the back of the presentation on how the VAT works. Because sometimes it's very confusing to people to think of the VAT. Parang gusto natin pirming exempt. Akala natin pag exempt, mas mabuti sa atin. Diba? Senior citizens, ah, gusto ko exempt ako sa, sa, sa medicines ko at sa pagkain ko sa restaurants kasi konti lang babayaran kong tax. But that's not always the case. Pag intermediate good ka, meaning you're an input to other products, yung producer ng VAT exempt good, hindi niya nakiklaim yung well, first, how does the VAT work, di ba? Merong output tax on the output of the firm, and then na 12%, at the same time, nakakaklaim siya ng credit na 12% of all the purchases subject to VAT. Yung tax on output, pinapasan niya sa consumers or users ng product niya, yung tapos na refund siya doon sa kanyang VAT na dinayag sa input. So in effect, walang natitirang VAT doon sa firm. Napapasan niya doon, nakiklaim niya as credit. Pero pag VAT exempt siya, hindi siya magbabayad ng output VAT, pero hindi din siya makakaklaim ng credit. So ang tanong, nag effectively, nagbayad yung producer ng tax. So, ang tanong is, pwede ba niyang, kaya ba niyang ipasa yung VAT dun sa inputs niya, dun sa consumer ng product niya? Depende yan ngayon sa structure ng market. Kung, kung ano yung position niya dun sa market. Malakas ba siya? Kaya ba niyang ipasa? O hindi? Ngayon, kung, kung yung producer na yon ay nandun sa dulo ng production chain, meaning ang pinuproduce niya final product, most likely, gusto niya na mabat exempt siya. Bakit? Kasi bababa yung presyo niya, mas marami bibili ng produkto niya. Pero kung siya ay intermediate producer, meaning producer siya of inputs to other products, Gusto niya, dapat, batable siya. Kasi pag hindi siya batable, tataas yung presyo niya kung kaya niya i-shift forward. At, at kung merong, ang tawag doon, substitution, yung susunod na producer would look, would rather use the substitute product as input. Diba? Kasi may may component na na-embed do na hindi kasi na-claim. On revenue, maliit lang ang impact nito. 31 billion. The VAT under the trade is slightly less regressive than the existing tax. So, i-increase yung tax, pero hindi naman ganun ka-regressive. On efficiency, isang issue kasi yung tax on in but or zero rated provision for indirect exporters. Uh, malaking discussion to nung Senate hearing. All the, the indirect exporters, the PESA, is very supportive of retaining the zero rating. What is, what is the um, rationale for zero rating indirect exporters. It's to encourage backward linkages of the export industry. Na instead na in-import nila, kasi yung exporters, pag in-import nila yung kanilang inputs, tax 
uh, tariff exemption. Pero kung bibili siya sa domestic, pag hindi siya zero rated, mas costly yung, yung input bought domestically. That is why there is need for zero rating. Or at least to encourage backward linkages. The problem is, sabi, sabi ng DOF, ah, mas gagawin namin mabilis yung pag-refund dun sa direct exporter. But then, mabagal nga yung refund. Ang bagal. Uh, we heard in the hearing, it, it takes so many years to get the refund to the point that sometimes the exporters just give up. <laughs> So, the, the problem really is sab, uh, merong leakage kasi, kaya gustong uh, tanggalin yung zero rating, especially for uh, non-PESA locators. Kasi yung PESA pwede niyang mamonitor. Diba? PESA is the administrator of the zones. So, kung yung indirect exporter nasa PESA or nag uh, nagtitinda siya to test allocators, medyo mas madali yung monitoring. But for indirect exporters, servicing or supplying to direct exporters registered under the BOI, mas problematic. So that's really the problem here. On cooperatives, um, again, yung agri-co-op Ang kanyang tindahin, part three, final product for consumption and part three, uh, for sales to agro, uh, food processing industries. So, depende kung mas ano ang tingin niya doon, okay ba sa kanya o hindi okay sa kanya yung uh, pagiging batabot. Kung ang tinitingnan niya, makakapubenta siya to food processing industry, this is not a bad change, even for the co-ops. Pero kung ang tingin niya, nagbebenta lang siya for final consumption, ayaw nga niya ito. But, and same for the sales of non-agri, non-credit, non-elected co-ops. Now, excise tax on petroleum, one of the more controversial uh, provisions of trade. Pare-pareho ang provision ng tatlong uh, bills to increase the excise tax from zero for diesel to three pesos in year one to five to six, gasoline from four thirty-five, seven, nine, ten, etc. The impact on revenue is large. So ito yung pangbawi dun sa mawawala sa personal income tax. Partly, 30 billion in the first year, 101 in 2019, 122 in the third year. We always hear, uh, pag may nagrarali, di ba? Sasabihin nila, the, the tax on petroleum product is regressive ang ma mahihirapan, ay mahihirap, etc., etc. Kesa sa mayayaman. But, when you actually look at the data, by the way, we're making use of the Family Income Expenditure Survey. And, we measured some index of progressivity. We found out that Petroleum product taxes are in fact marginally progressive, hindi naman very progressive, low numbers there. And in fact, the change in the excise tax burden makes the tax slightly more progressive. Kaya lang, even if we say, oh, oh progressive siya, mas malaki yung babayaran no? mayayaman in relative terms, the fact remains natataas pa rin yung babayaran ng mahihirap. And then, take note na dun sa personal income tax, marami ng exempt to start with, di ba? 
yung minimum wage workers hindi na yung nagbabayad. So yun, walang ganansya, so to speak. They don't gain anything from the personal income tax reform, but they will have to shoulder the higher tax burden from here. On economic efficiency, it's likely to reduce road congestion and pollution, likely to reduce use of relatively more positive fuel, the diesel, and will, but it will have also some impact on inflation. Our estimate is that it, the impact is about 0.6% in 2018, additional 0.4% in 2019, and additional 0.2% in 2020. Uh, this might differ from other estimates. Let me just point out that here we make we make you we make use of your uh, input output model in estimating the price change. Maybe DOF is using another model, mas economic at asila. Now excise tax on automobiles. This is interesting. Ito yung existing. Ito yung HB 4774 and 1408. Essentially, dinodoble yung tax rate. In fact, dito sa mas expensive na vehicles, more than double yung tax. But compare that with 5636, nagdoble Dito sa murang koche, mas mababa ang increase dito sa mas mahal na koche. Gusto mo ng Fortuner, bumili ka na ngayon ng Fortuner. Ngayon pa lang, bago tumaas. Parang, so in, in a sense, ang tagline kasi ng excise tax on automobiles is, it's a luxury tax. Tama naman, di ba? Hindi naman lahat ng tao kaya bumili ng kotse. Kaya lang, if it is indeed a luxury tax, you'd expect na mas mataas ang increase mo sa tax rate doon sa mga mas mahal kesa doon sa mura ng mga kotse. Um, Philip Medalla has a nice way of explaining this. Sabi niya, if you want to tax, to tax, to impose a luxury tax, pumili ka ng bagay na talagang gusto, gusto ng mga tao na ipagmayabang. Magandang bahay, malaking bahay. Lagyan mo ng luxury tax. Hindi, masaya sila doon dahil ibig sabihin talagang bida sila, di ba? Magandang kotse, mahamahaling kotse is something like that too. Alahas, parang ganun din yun, except na yung alahas, mas mahirap i-collecta yung tax. Kasi pwede underground, etc. But I thought that was a nice way of explaining. Diba? Yung, ang luxury tax, or yung bagay na yung tax mo, ibigay mo sa bagay na gustong ipagmayabang ng tao, pang forma. Revenue dito, this is not our estimate because we couldn't get data on car production by type, by price, by price bracket. This is a DOF estimate. The incidence is of course expected to be progressive, but less so pag yung 5636. Uh, ang nakakabili lang ng kotse I think is design 7 up, yung richest 30% of the population, yun lang based on family income expenditure survey. But one of the problem here is the CARS program. Ito yung programa ng DPI where they enticed, ang uh, alam ko na, 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 na inganyo is Mitsubishi to come here and produce the cars here. Bibigyan ng incentive, uh, para dito sila mag-produce instead na ini-import natin in full ng buo yung poche. So bagong programa lang to, we might be skeptical on the the success of the CARS program, pero nandyan na yung programa eh. 
Some issue is bakit bakit increase natin na yung tax bago lang tong programa to para isang taon pa lang yata. So it introduces policy uncertainty from the perspective of the investors. Lalo na ito 5636 na baligtad nga ng ang ang apekto kasi sa cars program yung nasa Muray. I think what they're going to produce is Mirage. Mm -hmm. So, mura lang yung iba. So, so, so yun, yun yung problema. Na yun ang mas mataas pa ang tax kaysa dun sa mas mahal. Pag 5-6. Sugar sweetened beverage. Again, this is an interesting uh, provision. Nasa ano lang to. By the way, yung HB 4774, wala siya doon. At saka... SB 1408, no provision on excise tax on sugar sweetened beverages. Pero this was introduced in the HB 5636, which is the committee report. The expected revenue, they say, is 452 billion. Again, uh, this is not our estimate. We picked up the DOF estimate. In terms of economic incentives, ito yung official na narrative coming from DOF that you want to discourage consumption of sugar sweetened beverage because it's associated with with the health risk but that health risk ito hindi benefit so risk of diabetes obesity etc the disadvantage is that Uh, this may hurt the poor who rely on some of these products as a cheap source of calories. Yung mga 3-in-1 daw, yun lang daw yung pangagahan ng mga mahihirap. But more important, and this I got from the column of Noel de Jos. Ang ganda ng column na to. I advise you to look at it. It says there is no externality involved in the excessive consumption of sugary drinks which will justify the imposition of the tax. Ang point of view niya is okay lang yung excise tax on petroleum products. It will reduce the externality, congestion, pollution. Okay lang yung uh, tax on alcohol, drunk and driving for instance. The externality. May, na, may nasasaktan, nakaharm na hindi yung nagko-consume, di ba? Kasi yung nagsisigarilyo or umiinom, most of the time, okay lang wala akong pakialam. Basta masaya ako. Pero nakaka-harm siya sa ibang tao. Pero dito daw, eh wala namang nakaharm na iba kung hindi yung mismo nag-over-consume. So dapat problema niya yon. So kung gusto niya yung gawin yun, di ba ba ako siya? Basically yun yung point na na-internalize. Na sino ba mahihirapan? Sino ba magkailangan magpagamot siya? So, anyway. So, I, I thought this was a nice article. Summary conclusion. What is good about the train? Let me just conclude. The overarching objective is laudable. Fairness, efficiency of the system while raising revenues to support build, build, build. It consists of a package of several measures for the first time. Pag nakalusot ito, meron tayong totoong tax reform package. And then it includes some compensatory measures. Uh, yung one of, I think that yung last provision in all the bills is that it will use some of the incremental revenues for targeted transfers. Um, overall impact on revenues, the high estimate that we show here, the same high estimate, is really less than the 200 billion initially proposed by DOF. And even that, this low, our high estimate, which is lower than the DOF, is not likely to be achieved due to poor incentives to self-employed individuals and professionals, that, as I explained earlier. And the risk of declining compliance 
Among steps is even more worrisome given performance of key tax administration agency in the second semester of 2016, which is the first semester of the Duterte administration. So flat in the case of the OC, decline, slight decline in the case of the IR. Who bears the burden? Change in tax burden, highest for the poorest decile, and declining as household income rises indicating the regressive character of the reform when one abstracts from the targeted cash transfer. So kung wala pa yung cash transfer, regressive siya. Now, gano'ng paraming cash transfer ang kailangan natin to compensate for the increase? Actually, ang dami. Kung lahat ipocompensate ko, but at the very least, we have to compensate perhaps the first two decides. I think yung incremental revenues from petroleum products, which is said to be 40% of that, is supposed to, uh, or is intended for the targeted cash transfers, medyo hanggang dito ang kaya na, hanggang decide three. So, pag kunyari, nangyari yun, sino ngayon ang magbabayad nung, nung tax? Di ba ito, isisiro nila yan kung, kung successful yung transfer. Sino ang nagbayad? Middle class. Okay. There's no free lunch. Somebody has to pay. Gusto natin ng additional revenue, somebody has to pay. Yun naman yung bottom line dito eh. Ang tanong lang, sana, always iniisip natin, sana hindi ako. Di ba? <laughs> but in this case, mukhang kaya yan. So that finding, that to that, I'm sorry, that finding in the previous slide, slide highlights the importance of compensatory transfers or targeted cash transfers to the poor. Under HB 5636, tatlong taon yung cash transfers. In the other two bills, isang taon lang. And I think malaki yung diferensya na yun. Because it's not likely na yung maghihirap talaga ay mararamdaman na nila yung additional benefits from the train, from the build, build, build. Kasi masyado pang maaga after one year. So palagay ko mas tama yung tatlong taon. Provided talagang yung growth that will come from build, build, build will be felt by or shared by the poor. Let me end my presentation there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Manasan. That was very really insightful. So we are now opening the floor for any questions. Just the user rules. Please state your name and your office. Okay. While you're thinking about the question, can I um, ask the first question? Um, you mentioned earlier that um, Based on the FIES, around 35, only 35% of income earners earn, of households, yeah, earn about 30, uh, 250,000 above. So, but actually the DOF estimates are even higher. According to them, 83% of the income earners will be exempted from the income tax. And that's not including yet the minimum wage earners. And if you include that, that would even uh, increase to 87%. So only 13% of the income earners will be paying income tax. My question is, um, so there seems to be a shift from income taxation to well, more reliance on indirect taxes, no? such as VAT and uh, excess taxes. Do you think this is, uh, this is the right step? No? 
we think this is more favorable for a country like the Philippines.
some people are talking, of course, of uh, relaxing the bank sickness. You know? And here, na po convince na sana ako. And then I, I, I got into this conversation again with Philip Medalla. In the point of view niya is be careful what you wish for. Kasi yung tax collection agencies na hindi ganun sa
industry actually nagiging din amin yung sinasabi ay nga ng mga trabahador ay mga pumasok kasi nagsuendo sa port or nagkatakuhan ng biyaya sa port fees. Pero ang um, um, ako ay coming from this. Uh, tinignan ko again yung family income expense, ano, uh, EPs, EPs, 2012 which is about the start of the port fees on a massive scale. Mas maaga siya nagsimula pero yung malaki yung hand mga 2012. At tinignan ko yung 2014-80s. What is remarkable, pag tinignan mo yung mga enrollment rate no, sa elementary at saka sa high school, ang tendency no, pag tinignan mo siya by decile or quintiles, mas mababa yung enrollment rate nung mahihirap. Sila yung unang nagda-drop out eh. Tapos pataas ng pataas habang lumala yung mayaman yung household yung sa income day side. What is remarkable for me is that the difference between 2012, uh, yung dalawang taon na tinignan ko from the start, sort of the start, or near the start of the 40s to about 2014. Yung sa 2014, na iba na yung picture. Ang net enrollment rate sa elementary pare-pareho na sa bawat quintile. Lahat sila 95%. So, para sa akin, wala ako, parang hindi siya ko, hindi ko pwede sabihin na ko sa yun. Pero yung association, at least for me, so striped na saan magagaling yun? Diba? Na pare-pareho, the same, yung poorest quintile, 95% net enrollment rate, same all throughout the quintiles. Tinignan ko din yung ano ang ginagastos ng mga pamilya para sa edukasyon. Again, doon nakita ko yung poorest quintile, ang laki ng increase niyang spending nila for education-related items between the two periods compared to yung increase. Lahat naman sila nag-increase ng spending, pero yung increase mas parang relatively mas malaki dun sa poorest two quintiles. And, and to me, parang at least at the macro level, pag tinignan mo yun, parang maiisip mo, hindi naman siguro ganun karami. Siguro pa meron nga na yung kanilang nakukuha sa 40s ay pinagbibili ng uh, pang-inom at pang-sigarilyo at pang-daya sa wete. Pero siguro Kasi yung, yung macro evidence, parang iba yung sinasabi. So, hindi ako masyadong worry doon. Now, ito, sabi ko, yun yung 40s. Ito naman, this is unconditional. Ito talaga, ito yung tunay na pangtawid eh. Na talaga naman, pag iisipin mo, binigyan mo sila ng pahirap eh. Diba? And they have no means. Wala silang paraan para para maibisan maibisan yung additional na pahirap na binigay mo because of this. Tataas lahat. So para ang sinasabi ng ito, tulungan natin sila for a fixed period. Si OS na, gusto lang nila sa mga one. Ako ay hindi ko more than one. Pero hindi naman yung sinasabi din ni Nimo na na forever. <laughs> So, <laughs> so yun, you can not. I, I think. Well, when we did that, you showed the slide earlier, yung slide 36, uh, incidence of proposed increased excise tax on petroleum products. So, medyo na ang lang na, hindi ko lang po na ipipihan. Why is there no SDB for the first year of implementation? Ay, wala lang. Wala. Does this mean, kasi on the third year of implementation, I, I observe na medyo mas mataas pa yung 
tax burden. So does this mean on the third year, mas, mas mahihirapan pa sila with the increase in excess tax? Kasi we can use this as argument para i-push na up, up to three years yung tax burden rather than the one. And, and this increase, by the way, bakit gano'n? It's relative to the base. It's relative to the base. Eh, di ba yung, yung tax base yung pinakita ko kanina? Una, 7 pesos, susunod, 9 pesos, susunod. Parang gano'n, di ba? Taas ng taas. Kaya, relative to the base yield, Kasi yung sinasabi ko ng DOF is minimal lang ko siya on the first year lang. Kaya doon lang kailangan ng transfer. So, maybe you can show this to, to our senators. Meron niyang year one. So, gusto lang na. Hindi kasi confusing initially yan eh. Dahil the original version, they were hoping na papasa yung trade na before June. So, sabi nila, yung year 1 nila is 2017 half year. So, hindi ko na siya pinakita kasi parang uh, magulo dahil half year. So, pero in fact, ang mangyayari, yung year 1 ay magiging 2018. Diba? Kasi tapos na yun. Pero what this slide says is that the tax burden will even be higher in the third year. year. Ma'am, um, definitely, this presentation, we 
iso also the same. So we are in the Medyo magiging magulo yung hindi sa kama po si SEP student kay Compensation Income Earners. Kasi nga po, si Compensation Income Earners, ang titig nung gina doon si taxable income yan eh. Kay SEP, ang basis mo gross um, sales receipts. Tapos if you lock them together, it is, you're just going to look at one tax table for them. Parang sa gigi magulo. So, nawawala na si concept of um, simplicity for both. Pero man, ano po kayong um, policy, policy recommendation nyo doon? Ihihiwalay po ba natin yung CSDs ng tax table? Pero again, that will create confusion din again. Um, para sa akin, hindi naman, pwede silang pagsamahin na ang tax base ng SEP ay net income as it used to be. Hindi naman dapat mali ang ang nakaka ang nag-focus ng horizontal inequity is the fact na yung uh, na yung 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 SEP din with gross receipts about below 3 million sabi mo based on gross. Kasi yun iba-iba, di ba? Kahit na yung 2.5 million kita mo pag sotan ka o na practically lahat yun kita, di ba? Net income yun, practically or maybe just 10% yung pwede yung pangalit. Ang tax nung magiging mga 9% o based relative to net income. Parang ganun. Pero yung tax nung, nung store owner na ang net income lang kahit 2.5 siya million is 30% of 2.5 which is what 750,000 tapos 8% diba on gross parang very inequitable so mas maganda nga na di net income siya pare-pareho kayo net income kasi yun naman ang tunay na kita yung net income hindi yung gross I'm not sure if you need another proposed uh, in OST from 40 to 20%. Tama. Hindi kasi marami akong mga kaibigan nila. Kasi ako po ano usually yung mga wala nang ma-charge iba. So, yun yung mga high high profit margin. So they opt for the optional standard. Kasi ang hirap mag-isip na ano ba ang pinipid ako kasi wala naman ako talagang pinipanda. So masyado malaki yung forty. Anyway, kung kung naman sa tingin mo mas malaki pa sa forty, pwede ka namang mag-IT man. Or I mean, mas malaki pa sa forty. So I think that one. Yes. Hindi ko alam kung ano yung I'm Sue Kandao, I'm from the Committee of Foreign Relations. I'd like to digress a little bit by asking about um, the avoidance of double taxation agreements between other, <coughs> excuse me, other countries. Because it is a problem of the Philippines to um, operationalize our tax policies. How come? that we are entering into agreements with different countries. In fact, I think we already have about um, bilateral agreements with more than 40 countries when it comes to avoidance of global taxation. My question is, uh, how come we are uh, getting into all these international commitments when we don't even have a study on this particular matter? Because we have asked the Department of Finance and also the your internal revenue. Every hearing that we've had in the past, and no study has been presented to us as to the cost-benefit analysis of all these tax treaties with the avoidance of tax uh, agreements. And I'm wondering if the PIBS has some study on this, and if you don't have, maybe suggest also we can <laughs> please help us by also studying this particular uh, uh, issue because it's been haunting us. The Committee on Foreign Relations has been having a hard time dealing with these tax treaties because na wala pong pag-aaral na ginagawa ang ating bansa. Yet, we keep on committing ourselves. Yet, we're complaining that we don't have 
I mean, you know, na it's hard to uh, collect taxes. Thank you. So far, is this 
the, the evidence shows that uh, this tends to create big benefit, especially for the poor members, poorer members of society. So the intent is to keep children at school, the intent is to keep mothers, uh, make them patronize, patronize the health clinics. The objective is there. And it's been shown by, by the study, some studies, there's, there's evidence that the, the goals have been achieved. Now this, against anecdotal evidence, the stories, because we often hear stories. My, our house helper one day approached me and said, when I go home to our province in Pangasinan, I said, why? You have your job here. No, sir, because I have to make pila for the poor fish. So she's earning from, from us as a house helper. At the same time, at certain days of the year, the month, she has to go back to the hometown and queue for the poor fish. So anecdotal evidence. Now, would that be a basis for changing policy or making policy? I would say is maybe we should do some systematic study. People who think that uh, uh, CCT is not a good policy intervention should try to gather data and do some study and show the evidence that uh, lifting it would be a superior uh, decision, a better decision than not taking it. For the moment, it's there. And for the moment, the evidence supports it as a good policy intervention. Now, on the unconditional cash transfer, there is talk around the globe, if you're reading the policy papers, about the minimum basic income. Even the advanced countries are talking of unconditional cash transfers. They call it the MBI, minimum basic income. Now, this may differ, the approach may differ across countries, and there are now experiments, even in, I think in the Scandinavian countries, about providing minimum basic income, simply because uh, in the, the experience shows that globalization, freer markets, open competition, really, while good for the economy and certain segments of society, this has really left behind a certain segment of the population. That's now, that's not, that's now, that, that, that's why we hear now a rising tide of protectionism. By me, sentiments mean protectionism and uh, backlash against globalization. Even in countries as advanced as the great uh, the United Kingdom and uh, even in the US. So, hindi yung ano. So, so hindi bago yung unconditional cash structure. No, ang, ang point in chat is, well, fixed period. Hindi naman yung tuloy-tuloy, tuloy na sinasabi ni Maring Winnie. Maring Winnie. Now, my last point I want to make is, okay, the shift, that's the first question. Shift toward more indirect taxes to direct taxes. So, paano ngayon yun? Does that make our tax system overall, overall tax system less progressive? Ano yung sagot kanina? It does, it does. Now, I would like you to bring you to the idea propounded by a long time ago by an economist called Nicolas Altor. <laughs> let's not tax income, let's not tax savings, but tax consumption. So yung mayaman, ang gusto i-consume ay luxury items, i-tax natin yung consumption niya. At yung matipid, ayaw kumain, wala siyang babayaran ang tax, ayaw niyo kumain. Ang babayaran niya yung, yung pagkain niya na merong waste consumption tax. Now, how practicable is that? That seems to be a very attractive idea. And in some way, we have brought this to the tax system by way of the VAT. Indirect tax yun, tax and consumption. Pero ang tama naman niya is pare-pareho across incomes. So, malalim itong mga issue na ito, natin masasagot ito. Ang sabi lang natin, merong there are different tax handles propounded over the years. Ang hinahanap natin, tax instruments, tax, or tax measures that would fulfill the canons of taxation. Simplicity, sinabi ka natin, simplicity, efficiency, fairness, or equity. Now, Gusto mong taklo na yun. 
Pag tinignan mo yun, inilapag mo yun sa impact ng, ng, ano, ng, ng taxation, ng proposed tax, at bawa, tinalaki natin ngayon, you can see differential impacts. What is worrisome is, if at the end of the day, it's the, not really the poor, because you exempt mo na eh. Binibig mo pa ng cash transfer. If it's just middle income, or oh, middle income, middle income classes, who ends, who ends up being squeezed. Mahirap din yun. Kasi tayo yun eh. Diba? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, hindi matatapos sa araw na itong diskusyon nito. But what I would like to say is, this is uh, quite an eye-opener also for me. For me, I started my, my career at the National Tax Research Center under Dr. Yubin Ko. Uh, but I <coughs> shifted to another area of, of research. Uh, when I went to PIDS, I went to infrastructure regulation, all those things, because tax, tax issue policy is under the channel. But it's a pleasant uh, morning for me because it brings me back to what we were discussing in those old days with Dr. Yubin Ko and the others who ended up packaging the comprehensive tax reform program the CTRP of 1997 was really under the efforts of Dr. Yuinko and the, of course, the SPASP Congress, but the, the, uh, the research, the analysis was done by Dr. Yuinko's school. Now, we are now with this comprehensive tax reform program, and I like what Chad said that for the first time, we're really trying to overhaul the entire system because it has five packages. And to palantize the package one, Mahihingal na tayo, ang mahirap pala ito. <laughs> it's not easy. Certainly, tax reform is never simple. It's gonna hurt some people, it relatively. It will also benefit some people, relatively. Maybe we should just try to look at balance. And that's what the senators, the legislators, the Congress have tried to do. Strike a balance because we can afford to uh, have trade-offs trade-offs which will severely impact on societal peace and stability. Kung sa trade-off mo, masarap nakatil against the middle class, mahirap din yun. At finally, finally, maganda sinabi ni Chuck, kasi, ano ba yun? Uh, kasi yung the first exempted uh, exemption, 250,000 pesos eh. So, tanong ko kanina, bakit kaya 250,000? Hindi ginawang 300. O 200, di ba? So, para may pagka-discretionary uh, pa yun, meron bang science behind the 250,000? Meron. Yung mga exemptions din natin lang. O nga. Pero pag binili ka may exemption, ano? Anong pa siya na exemption? Bakit yung ating personal exemption is so much? Merli, magkano yung personal exemption? Yung personal 50. Diba? Bakit 50? Alam mo, nung araw sa NTRC, ginawa namin nung no? kinumpit namin yung ano, how much calories you need to survive a day or a month. And then we put a money value to it. One of the exercises we did to arrive at a basic exception, we call it personal and additional allowances, we converted the calorie requirements into pesos. So kaya mayroong certain money value kasi kailangan mo yun para mag-survive. Pero may ano, 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 bakit ito? So, tama si John, siguro, for civic duty and to get a sense that you're contributing to society, you just have to pay a minimum, a minimum tax. In other countries, they will call it a poll tax, head tax. But that's another issue. Maraming discussion dito, I'm sure this will not be the end of it. Thank you very much for participating in this. Thank you, Dr. Yasko. So with that, we are now closing.